So tonight I want to start by talking to you guys about intelligence. And specifically I want to tell you about how we can use technology to leverage the intelligent processes we can already find in nature, and then how we can use that technology to apply it to our own design practices to solve our complex design challenges. So a little bit about me, I work at The Living Group, which is an applied research and design consultancy working within the research organization of Autodesk. So a lot of you probably know Autodesk as the maker of design tools like AutoCAD and Revit and 3D Studio Max. But in the research organization, we're developing new technologies that are going to bring about the future of design tools that you're going to use. And my research specifically is focused on artificial intelligence. And I've been working with my team on methods of applying artificial intelligence technologies to design practice to allow us to design things that we couldn't do before. So artificial intelligence has kind of exploded in the popular imagination in the last few years, both in the technical fields as well as in popular culture. But when we think about artificial intelligence, we typically think about it within the context of technology or computer science. But in fact, almost all of the basic principles of artificial intelligence that we have are somehow rooted in the intelligence that we've observed in natural systems. So what I want to do tonight is introduce you to three distinct paradigms of intelligence that we find in nature. I'm going to show you how those paradigms have been applied and adapted to develop the technologies of artificial intelligence. And then I'm going to show you a few examples of how we've used these technologies to solve complex design challenges in our own design practice. The first paradigm of intelligence in nature is what I call the collective. And the collective has to do with the way that complex patterns and behaviors emerge in nature based on the interaction of a large number of relatively simple organisms. So here you see a flock of birds called starlings, and they're performing an act that we call the murmuration. But how are these simple organisms, these tiny birds, able to coordinate such complex, beautiful behavior? And we know that birds aren't the most intelligent creatures, but even if they had the kind of communication devices that we have, there's still no way they can coordinate this kind of act in this large of a number. But in fact, we see this kind of behavior all throughout nature. We see it in the flocking of birds. We also see it in the organization of ant trails. We see it in the complex architecture of termite mounds. And we also see it in the growth patterns of even the most simple organisms like slime molds. So how can we understand and replicate this kind of collective intelligence in artificial systems? Well, in fact, computer scientists have figured out that they can replicate this kind of complex behavior by doing exactly what nature does. So instead of starting to program these kind of behaviors and patterns from the top down, as we typically would, you can just create a collection of autonomous agents, and then you can program them with a few set, a small set of very simple behaviors or rules. And then just like nature, you create many, many of these, like a population, and you let them play out. You let them interact with each other in a simulated environment. So here you see uh, three basic rules which dictate flocking behavior in a simulated system. And you can see the rules are few and very simple, right? There's a separation rule where the, the agent kind of keeps its distance so as not to collide with the rest of the population. There's an alignment rule where the agent slowly changes their heading or their direction to kind of line up with its neighbors. And there's a cohesion rule where the agent, if it's far away from the crowd, would generally drift towards its, uh, its other, uh, the other agents in the system. And you can see that each of these agents doesn't know anything about the collective as a whole. It just has local information of just what's going on in the immediate area around it. So let's take a look at a simulation of this behavior. So you can see a population of these agents, and at first they swim around kind of randomly, but as soon as we turn on just these simple three sets of behaviors, you see the flocking patterns emerge very quickly, seemingly out of nowhere. So how can we use this kind of collective intelligence and behavior in our own design processes? Well, we can use them to solve design problems for which we don't necessarily have direct top-down solutions. 
And I want to show you an example of how we've used this kind of collective behavior in our own design work. And I want to talk to you about this project, which we call Hi Fi. So about three years ago, my group won a design competition to design and build a temporary installation inside the courtyard of the MoMA PS1 Museum in Queens, New York. Now, the program of this pavilion was quite simple. Uh, every summer, PS1 hosts a series of weekend music festivals, and the structure is just meant to provide a place for people to relax, hang out, get some shade, get some water, and just escape the hot summers of New York City while they're at this event. But in the 10 or so years since this uh, competition has been going on, it's become famous for allowing young architecture practices to experiment with new ideas. So when we started uh, working on, on our proposal, we looked at the last 12 years of the 12 installations that had come before us. And what we found was a huge range of experimentation with form, with structure, with material, and basically addressing every issue about the project, except for the one that we thought that was most important, which was what's going to happen to all the material in these structures once the structure has to go away, because it's a temporary installation, right? So we made this problem of going away the primary focus of our installation, and we imagined a new kind of architecture. We imagined an architecture that wasn't just sustainable and highly efficient while it was being constructed and once, uh, while it was being used, but an architecture that once its productive life was over, it can completely go away as if nothing had ever happened. So in other words, we imagined an architecture that was specifically designed to disappear. And to do this, we developed a new kind of building material. This building material is made up of two materials. One, which is agricultural waste, in this case, corn stalks that we uh, got from farms in upstate New York. Now this isn't the productive part of corn, the kernels that we like to eat. This is the waste that's left over once they harvest those kernels. So we take that uh, corn stalk, we chop it up, and then we mix it with mycelium. And mycelium is the root structure of mushrooms. And you mix this stuff together and you put it into a form. And over the course of a week, the mycelium gets activated and it starts to eat the corn stalk. And as it eats, it grows into the corn stalks, eventually forming a solid material with structural properties that are similar to styrofoam. After this material grows, we harvest it, and we can use it to build our structure. And once that structure no longer serves its purpose, we can take that material and we can put it directly back into the ground. So I'm not talking about recycling here. I'm talking about with no added energy, you take that thing which used to form our structures, you put it in the soil, and within a few months, it's composted and it completely goes away, like the building had never existed. So we grew 10,000 of these bricks that summer, and we used them to construct a 40-foot tall structure inside the courtyard of MoMA PS1. Now it stood there for three months over the summer, People loved it, people danced around it, in it, on top of it. But inevitably, like all things, eventually the summer had to end. And once the structure had to go away, we systematically disassembled it, we composted every single one of these bricks, and we donated the compost to local community gardens in Queens. Thank you. So this project had a lot going on with it. Uh, There's a lot of issues of sustainability and material science. We had a lot of partners, which I don't have time to mention. But for the purposes of this presentation, I want to focus on a specific design problem that we encountered when we were designing this building. And this was how we were going to actually lay out these bricks to describe this complex, doubly curved surface. And the problem we came up with is if you take a standard brick module and you start laying it in a kind of running bond, a traditional brick, uh, brick pattern, the courses as you go up the surface are actually constantly changing in length because the whole thing is described by these doubly curved surfaces. 
And when you, you run into this problem that as you start laying the courses, you either run out of space or you develop a gap at the end of the course. And if you want to space those bricks out so you fill in that gap, you start to run into bearing issues here where the running bond no longer holds. And this is a big problem for us because these bricks were actually acting as the structure. There was nothing behind it, it was just that surface. Now, this problem is encountered a lot in masonry. And what traditionally masons do is, uh, you know, they're dealing with this brick, which is a homogeneous material. So if they run out of space or they have a gap, they simply take a brick, they cut it, and then they fit it into the structure, nice and easy. The problem was our bricks were not homogeneous building materials. They were organic materials. And here you can see a cross section of these bricks. And what you'll see is as the brick grows into the mold, the mycelium forms this continuous layer of mushroom material on the outside. And that continuous membrane is where a lot of the structural and environmental properties of the brick come from. And if you cut the brick, you expose this kind of loose fill that's on the inside, and they no longer perform uh, as they have to. So we couldn't cut the brick. So now we have this problem, which is actually quite common in computational design, which is how to describe a kind of arbitrary complex surface with just a few different structural modules. Because of course, you know, we can create different sizes of bricks, but we couldn't create every single different size brick. And what we came up with in the end was three different brick modules. A full brick about this size, a half a brick, and a quarter brick. And we needed to define this entire surface just through those three modules. But try as hard as we might, we just couldn't create a model or a system to deterministically, from the top down, take the surface that we had in the computer and figure out how to make it out of these three modules. We did try a lot of different things, but in the end, what worked was a bottom-up system, and instead of deterministically telling the, the, the building how to compose itself, we let the bricks do it on their own. So here you see an animation of the brick laying algorithm that we developed. Now, in this algorithm, the bricks have their own agency to build the structure. So they start laying out the surface one by one, like you would on the site, and they're given information. So each brick knows whether it's being supported properly from the course below. It also knows when it reaches the end of a course, whether there's a gap left over or it runs out of space. And then, if the brick encounters any problem with either of those two criteria, it's given agency. And it's allowed to go back in time, go back in the course where the problem occurred, and replace itself with another size module, and then restart the whole process again. And we run this algorithm iteratively over and over and over, over all the courses, and eventually describe the entire tower. And this configuration was developed from the algorithm from the bottom up, so it's completely unpredictable, but it works. And we use this digital model directly on the construction site to tell the people laying the bricks the sequence of the three different modules that they had to lay. And we didn't have anything like a working set of drawings, we just had a cut sheets taken directly from this digital model. And what was interesting is we were able to actually express the process, the bottom-up collective intelligent process that led to the structure in the physical structure itself. And what we did is we took every one of those small quarter brick modules and whenever one of those wasn't contributing directly to the structural performance of the surface, we took it out. And it formed these little windows that you'll see in the structure that let the light in. And these little windows contributed a lot to the experience of the structure. This is the view from the inside. And the placement of these windows looks really random and kind of natural and organic, you might say. But just like everything in nature, it's not random. It's a direct physical embodiment of this kind of collective intelligence that led to the construction of this structure. And not only did we develop this algorithm to help us build the structure, we also published it and we presented it at an academic conference. And this relates to a lot of how our studio works. We like to develop new technologies, not just to use in our own design work to solve our own design problems, but we also like to share that with the rest of the community. All right, you guys ready for the next one? Awesome. The species. The species is the second paradigm of natural intelligence. 
And the species relate to the way in which nature is able to use the evolutionary process to evolve many, many different organisms that each are specifically adapted to their environment. So for example, the way that the hummingbird evolves a very long, thin beak and the ability to hover in midair just so it can get at the sap deep inside the tree that no other organism can get to. So how is nature able to do this? How is it able to evolve this multitude of creatures, all very different, but all highly efficient and highly optimized? Well, nature is able to do this because nature doesn't design like we do. You know, for us, we take a design problem and we focus on just developing a single static solution, the perfect solution to that problem. Nature doesn't do that because it's operating in an environment where the perfect solution is always changing. The problem is always changing as nature itself changes. So instead, nature works with a system called a species. And a species is a kind of dynamic system model which doesn't just describe one form, it describes a related collection of forms. And let's just think of those forms, those individual organisms, like separate solutions to a design problem. For example, all of us in this room, right? We're all humans. We all share some characteristics, but we're all individuals, and we all behave slightly differently. Now let's go back a little bit to high school biology and talk about how the species works. And there's two fundamental properties of the species that relate to the way nature is able to use these things for evolution. The first is the genotype. The genotype is the data that encodes all the possibilities of each organism that belongs to that species. And the genotype is crucial to evolution because it's the, it's the, the material that evolution uses to actually uh, recombine different pieces of information and create and evolve new iterations and new generations of that species. And the second property of the species is the phenotype. And this is the physical manifestation of the genotype after it's been allowed to uh, grow and develop in nature. And the phenotype is crucial to the evolutionary process because it's the thing that decides the fitness of that specific organism. And it decides whether that organism is fit and high performing enough to live long enough to then engage in reproduction, recombine its genotype with another organism, and make children and make the next generation of iterations. Now, nature is able to take this species model and it's able to use evolution to evolve it to specifically address the needs of its environment. And it's able to do this, like a lot of things in nature, through a small set of very simple operations. So you have selection, which dictates whether a phenotype is fit to survive. You have reproduction, where two high-performing uh, mix together their genotypes and create a child for the next generation. And then crucially, you have mutation. And mutation uh, creates variations, random inputs into the gene pool, which allow the organism to continuously adapt even as the environment is changing. And just through these two simple tools, you have a species model that encodes a variety of possibilities, and you have an evolutionary process guided by a discrete set of operations, which is able to take that species model and adapt it to its environment. Just with these two tools, nature over billions of years has been able to evolve the huge amount of diversity that we see in our world. So why am I talking to you about evolution tonight? Well, it's because in our practice over the last few years, we've actually been looking at whether we can enact the same kind of evolutionary processes in computation using artificial systems to design better fit solutions to our own complex design problems, just like nature would. So let's take a look at how we can do this. And to take advantage of these evolutionary processes, we basically have to start thinking about designing like nature designs. And the first step is to stop thinking about designing static objects as kind of perfect design solutions and to start designing species of our own. So let's take a look at what I mean by designing a species. So let's take a building project, okay? So you have this building here. It might be a good building, it might be a bad one, I don't know. But let's say, instead of designing just this one building, we design a system, a model which can create that building, but it can also create a lot of other variations of buildings 
that address the same program, but in different ways. And to control those different variations, let's say we expose a set of knobs. And these are kind of the controls, which by tweaking those controls, we can create different variations of that solution. Now, a lot of you guys probably know this and use it in your own work. This is what we call parametric design, right? We expose a set of parameters to our design models to make it easier for ourselves to adapt those designs to changing conditions. And traditionally, these tools are used in a kind of direct um, designer-driven way. So for example, you might take a building and you might expose the height of the roof as a parameter and then the client tells you, oh, the, the height of the roof needs to change, so you tweak that parameter, the whole model updates, and your life is easier, right? So we've been using these tools for, for a little bit of time just to make our own traditional design processes easier and more straightforward. But what I'm trying to tell you is we can use the same kind of model and allow the computer to tweak those parameters on its own to autonomously evolve better and better solutions without our input. But to do that, we need one additional part to this model. We need a way for the computer to know which designs are good and which designs are bad. And that's because the computer doesn't know anything about design, right? It doesn't have an intuition about our design problems or our solutions. Instead, we need to give numerical measures that tell the computer how that performance works. But if we, if we create this kind of model, and you know, and we can think of these, these input uh, knobs and these output gauges as a kind of user interface for our model, and that user interface allows the computer to gain access to our design system. And if we develop our models in this way, we can take advantage of computational systems called optimization algorithms, which can actually take our models and without knowing anything about architecture or design, or aesthetics or anything like that, they can take these models and they can tweak those parameters and they can monitor the metrics, these gauges coming out, and they can tweak them in such a way to create better and better designs. And in fact, one of the most popular and most used optimization algorithms that exist is called the genetic algorithm. And the genetic algorithm is specifically designed to replicate the natural evolutionary process that I described to you previously. Let me just tell you intuitively how the genetic algorithm works. So the genetic algorithm behaves just like nature does, and it starts by creating an initial population of designs. Okay, so let's take a simple example here. Let's say, for instance, there's just 10 designs in the generation, and there might be hundreds of thousands of them. For this example, let's say 10. And, you know, this is pretty abstract, but this is what the computer sees. This is how the computer will look at your design model. It doesn't know anything about form or, or, or function or anything like that. It just sees inputs and outputs. And here we have six binary inputs. They're just switches that the computer can flip on and off. And then this box will represent our single output. Okay, this is the number that's telling the computer which designs are good and which are bad. And in this case, higher numbers equal better designs. So here you see the computer created 10 random designs by randomly flipping these switches. But these six parameters lead directly to a design. So for example, let's say like this combination is like a certain kind of building, another combination is a different kind of building. Now it creates these designs and then it can score them, right? In, this, in the model, it can get these metrics back from the model and then it can rank those designs from best to worst. And now the job of the genetic algorithm is to develop the next generation of designs just like nature does. So how does it do this? Well, it can do it in two different ways. Number one, it can take the best, the top designs in the first generation and can put them directly into the next generation to preserve that genetic, that high-performing genetic information. Then, it can do something like what nature does. It can take two high-performing designs and it can breed them. It can cross them together. It can take some input information from one and some from the other to make a new child. And the idea here is very similar to nature, that if you have two designs that are both performing pretty well, there's something about their input parameters that makes them successful. And chances are, if you take some inputs from one and some from the other, that the child might inherit both of the good strategies and perform even better than both of its parents. So the genetic algorithm uses this crossover operation to develop the next generation of designs. So here we have 10 more designs. Now we can use mutation to randomly change some of those switches to introduce new strategies into the process. And once we have the next generation, we can score them, rank them, and the whole process begins again. 
And by going through this operation hundreds, even thousands of times over many, many different generations, this genetic algorithm is able to evolve our designs and search through that species model for good solutions. And what's cool about this process is it doesn't have any pre-biases. As long as we develop the model, it can search that model, and not only can it find good solutions to our design problems, it can find solutions that we might not have thought of on our own. So we've been using this kind of evolutionary design process in a lot of our projects, and I just want to share one of those with you today. This is the A320 Bionic Partition Project that we designed in partnership with a research group at Airbus, the maker of the A320 aircraft. So we're about halfway through the presentation now, so I'm going to take a little break. I'm going to let my colleagues from Airbus describe the problem we are facing to you. We are committed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% uh, until 2050. This requires from us to develop new technologies which make airplanes much lighter. We come up with new design principles to find out what makes sense in the future. We call it bionic. This is what the nature has done for millions of years. That we are able to copy the nature this is, I didn't expect that, to be honest. Certainly the bionic partition, as we call it, is also one product which has its roots in the biomimicry area. We have selected one of the most difficult structural components inside the A320 cabin. We combine generative design, 3D printing and additive manufacturing. If you think about the future and our task for the future, the biggest thing means we have to reduce weight. With bionic structures, we have a weight reduction potential of 50%. We have up to 95% raw material use, and we have the chance to reduce the production steps by 50%. And this is just possible with generative design using Autodesk software. If this works, it works everywhere else. Now, step by step, we start to, to look for more uh, cabin parts and see where we can implement bionic design. I see here the biggest change I've ever seen. We have very long life products, you know. Each kilogram which we doesn't design in today doesn't cost fuel burn the next 25 years. It helps our customers, the airlines, and it helps the environment. So the A320 Bionic Partition came out of a collaboration between our group at Autodesk and a research group at Airbus. And the goal of our collaboration was to see if we can leverage the innovations in manufacturing, specifically around metal as a manufacturing 3D printing that was happening at Airbus with the innovations and software design tools that we were researching at Autodesk. And for the collaboration as a kind of first prototype, we chose to tackle this uh, component, which is the partition wall inside of the cabin. And this is the thing that's usually behind, between you and the bathroom, right? It seems like a kind of banal piece of uh, structure in the airplane. You probably wouldn't give it a second thought. But in fact, this component offers a few very difficult structural uh, problems. The partition wall is anchored into the substructure of the aircraft. So it's connected directly to the fuselage and the seat rails below. But it has to fully support this cabin attendant seat. And this is a seat that flips down where the flight attendants sit during takeoff and landing. And this seat is not attached to the substructure of the aircraft. It's only attached to this partition. So the partition is the only thing that carries the full weight of two cabin attendants and the seat back into the substructure. So it's a pretty tough structural problem. So because of the structural difficulty, um, the new panels that Airbus has been getting from the suppliers have been pretty heavy and pretty expensive. So we're interested if we can use these innovations in both 3D printing manufacturing and generative design to solve this problem in a new way. And our goals were, were pretty optimistic. We wanted to create a partition wall with the same structural performance as what's flying today, but do it with half the weight. 
And we decided to tackle this problem by looking at nature. And instead of from the top down, the kind of engineering mentality, sit down and draw out how to design the structure, we thought maybe we can grow it, just like nature grows complex, high-performing structures. And to look at that growth, we looked at the way that slime mold grows. Now we saw slime mold a little bit earlier, so let me explain to you how slime mold works. As the slime mold grows on the, on the forest floor, it first starts by sending out a dense uh, network of connections. Because it doesn't know what's going on up there, it's just kind of growing. But then based on where it finds the food, it starts to prune those connections such that it just keeps the ones that give the fastest, the most direct access to the food. So basically it creates this highly efficient logistics network for food distribution. And we were interested if we can tap into this kind of bottom-up growth strategy to create a super efficient system for distributing the loads through our partition. So here's the description of our generative design model. This is our species model, right? Uh, so we start with the outline of the, the partition, and here we create a dense network of like all of the different possible uh, structures that can happen inside of this of this space. Right? This is all the possible structural members, and then we instantiate a series of food points. Okay, and these are represented by these, this heat map, and based on those food points, the structures start to prune themselves such that only the ones that go through the most food points remain. But crucially, you know, this is one design, but now we can start to move around those food points. And those are parameterized, they're controllable with those knobs, and they allow us to make not just one design, but a series of designs. And at this point, we don't know yet, we're not making any assumptions about which designs work better or worse. We want to keep it uh, completely open. Here's the image showing how varying one slider, one parameter at a time, can create this kind of variety of designs. You can see they're not random, right? Here we're just varying one number, and it's kind of morphing. And because it's like kind of like a continuous space, the genetic algorithm can start to tune those parameters and find those sweet spots of parameters to create highly efficient designs. Now here's a description of our design model. So this is the same exact species model I showed you, with the input parameters on the left side. So there's 13 parameters that drive each of these design uh, iterations. So we have one design here, and because we're in the computer and this is a structural problem, we can run each design automatically through structural uh, simulation software. So here's the, the panel being simulated. And that structural simulation gives us back a series of metrics. So it tells us about the weight, and we tell the computer, take that number, that weight number, and try your hardest to minimize that number. Make that as small as possible. We also have uh, indicators about displacement. So this is the stiffness of the, of the panel. Displacement is how much the panel moves after we apply that load to it. And we tell the computer, minimize that displacement as well. So we want the lightest weight partition that is as stiff as possible, right? Those are our two goals. And then we have a constraint saying, whatever you do, uh, no piece of that structure can exceed 50% of the stress capacity of the material we're working with. So this is a constraint saying, even if you have a really good design and simulation, if any of those pieces succeed, that's a kind of a dangerous situation, so you don't consider that design. So this is our uh, design setup. This is the way we modeled it in Dynamo. This is a software similar to Grasshopper for designing parametric models. You can see the set of inputs on the left side and the set of outputs on the right side. This is something you can already do in software that we have today, right? And once we have that model, that species model, we can unleash the genetic algorithm onto it to explore that design space. So here you see a variety of different solutions, right? So this genetic algorithm starts cranking through solutions, making thousands and thousands of iterations. Here we just take a sample of the ones that are very high performing, and we sort them according to the two objectives, the weight and the structural performance. And you see the kind of range of, range of designs that, that, we, that we develop. And what we can also do is start to visualize the way that that genetic algorithm explores the possibility of this design model of this species. So here we have a scatter plot where each dot represents a single design iteration of 10,000 that we explored. And they're mapped here based on the two objectives again. So we have displacement on the y-axis and the weight on the x-axis. And what you can see start to form is this kind of boundary. See that? Now, if you think about it, what we really want 
if it was possible, was a design right here. We want a design that weighs zero kilograms and that's infinitely stiff. Now we know that that doesn't exist in the physical world, so the goal of this algorithm, what it's actually doing, is it's trying to develop designs and it's trying to push that boundary further and further to this conceptual point, which we call the utopian point. And you see these uh, designs are colored by generations, so red ones are later. You can see how it's trying to push those designs and develop better and better solutions. And we can also take all these designs, we can reproject them into the input space. So this is using a clustering algorithm to figure out what, what are the design typologies in this design system. Not only what are the individual designs that are high performing, but tell me about, like, given those 13 inputs, tell me about which designs are similar in the input space. Like, which designs have similar settings of those inputs. And then we can reproject them to the outputs. And here what we have is we're taking the, the, the most high performing designs on that, on that frontier, on that edge, and we're looking at the relationship between the input parameters and the design typologies to the performance in the output space. And this is teaching us not just, you know, it's not just giving us single design solutions, it's actually teaching about us about the design problem itself. And this is really important because, you know, we use this, these tools a lot in our design work, but oftentimes, instead of just using them to develop a single design, we actually don't want it to design this thing for us. We, instead, we want it to tell us about what's possible. And we use that knowledge of what's possible. For example, you know, we see in some of these heavier examples the kind of pattern of structural distribution that might be very effective. We see these lighter examples with the minimum structure. We use these, all these different iterations to teach us about what are the possible good solutions, and we apply that knowledge to our own design process. So it's a kind of hybrid solution. It's a kind of partnership between us and the algorithm to design a better component. So given this design, uh, we developed the final version here. And then we have a, a series of steps to get it to a final working, fully manufactured part. I'm not going to go too much into these steps here today. Uh, but basically, we can take each of those what we call macro bars, the pieces that were evolved by the algorithm. We can break it down into a series of smaller micro lattices. So the final partition has 50,000 of these little structures. We can simulate the, the distribution of stress in the entire partition of 50,000 little pieces. And we can change the size of each of those little lattices such that we decrease the weight even more and we optimize the part and distribution of stress even further. And then we take that partition and we have to break it down into 116 individual components that would fit inside the printer bed of one of these state-of-the-art additive manufacturing machines. Now, these aren't prototyping machines. I'm talking about direct-to-production metal additive manufacturing. Whatever comes out of this printer can go directly into the airplane. So once we print all these parts, we can reassemble it into the final partition. And here's an image of the fully working, fully testable prototype, which is undergoing testing right now at Airbus for certification to fly an A320 of the future. And here we see our colleagues from Airbus test fitting it into that aircraft. And finally, just the animation showing the entire process from start to finish. You see one iteration of the design growing from this kind of collective intelligence. And then you see the GA, the genetic algorithm, get access to that model and start evolving better and better design solutions. And then finally, once the design is reached, we see the rationalization into the final produced part. How are you guys doing? Yeah. Still with me? Yeah. All right, cool. So let's finish it off. Let's talk about the third paradigm. And the third intelligence paradigm I want to discuss, I call the neuron. And this relates to our own intelligence. And it relates to the way that our own brains are composed of a highly networked collection of billions and billions of these tiny cells called neurons. Now, our brains is by far the most complex computational processing tool that we've ever known. And most theorists say that it's probably the most complex tool we'll ever know because it's actually the tool that we use to know things with, right? So we're kind of like at the limits of what is possible here. Let's just think of it like a system, like a model for intelligence from nature. And let's think about how we can enact these things into technology. Okay, so 
In a very basic level, we can think of the brain as a signal processing system, right? It takes in data from our world, and we take in that data through all of our senses. We touch things, we uh, look at them, we smell them. All that data comes in as kind of raw information. It enters our brain, and then it's passed through these highly networked layers of billions and billions of these neurons until it reaches some level inside of our brains, which we call maybe knowledge. And this part of the brain allows us to make predictions about the future based on that information that came in from our senses. Now, when I say that our brains allow us to predict the future, that might sound very science fiction, right? But in fact, all of us are using our brains to predict the future every single day. And predicting the future is actually the most important function of our brains, and it it's what allows us to succeed in the evolutionary process that I described. By predicting the future, our brains allow us to survive by keeping us from doing stupid things most of the time. <laughs> so let's take a look at how our brains learn to predict the future by looking at one of the most simple examples of learning. And this is how a child learns about a hot stove. So when we're born and when we're children, our brains are kind of full of potential, but they don't know anything yet because all of those connections of all those different neurons are kind of randomly wired. They don't, they don't have a good way of processing that information into knowledge. So the first time you see a hot stove, you don't know anything about the stove, but you're curious, right? You want to explore your world, you want to get data from the world, so you might approach that stove and you touch it. You touch that hot stove and you get burned. And that burn is like a negative feedback back inside your brain. But even if you get burned, the first time you do this, you might not learn anything because it's kind of just you know, two random occurrences that happen at the same time. So the next time you see a hot stove, you might want to touch it again. You're still curious. And you touch it again, and you get burned again. Another negative signal back into your brain, and now we're starting to learn. And what happens is the network rewire, or the, the brain rewires itself such that whatever those inputs coming from the world of that hot stove are, like you know, the heat coming off of it or the red coils, the brain rewires the connection between its neurons so that that input correlates and leads to this prediction of the future, which says, I know what's going to happen if I touch that stove. It's going to hurt. You better not do it. But of course, predicting the future has huge implications for our society beyond what's going on in our own brains. So actually, since the beginning of computers, computer scientists have been obsessed with replicating the same kind of process inside of an artificial system. And this obsession has led to the development of the field called machine learning. And machine learning is the reason why most of you guys here probably know about artificial intelligence. But in fact, one of the key technologies of machine learning is specifically modeled to replicate the way that we think our own brains work. And this technology is called the artificial neural network. You might have heard this before. Let me just tell you a little bit about how it works. So the artificial neural network is a computational device, and it's structured to work similar to our brains. It's composed of a highly networked set of a series of small modules. And in this case, these modules are represented by these circles. And it might be like a very simple computational device. Uh, maybe you know, it adds two numbers together, or it multiplies them, or something like that. Very simple operations. But what we can do is we can create a lot of these neurons in a kind of layer. And then we can create many layers of these neurons. And we can wire together. We can connect the neuron from each layer to all the other neurons in the layer after it. So it forms a kind of dense network, right? And these connections allow each neuron to pass its information, or some portion of its information, to the neurons of the layer below. And the way that that information is passed is dictated by a parameter on each connection. So each connection has a kind of property, we call it a weight, that dictates how this neuron passes information to this one. 
So these kind of structures are incredibly flexible, and they can be used to address a huge variety of problems in our everyday world, basically to make predictions or to correlate input data coming into the network to output data that results, that comes out of it. And one of the applications that's probably the most well-known for these kind of artificial neural networks is image recognition. So teaching a computer to recognize objects in images, right? So let's take a look at this example. Say we have a collection of photographs of animals, and we want to teach this artificial neural network to identify what that animal is. An abstract problem, right? The computer doesn't know anything about cats or dogs or fish or anything like that. But what we can do is we can directly input the data from those images straight into the network. So we can take the pixel information in this picture, and we just put it into that first layer of the, net of the network. And then that information gets passed down through subsequent layers based on how these connections are wired. And eventually it ends up at the last layer. And here, maybe this neuron gets the most activated. And it's related to the cat category. The computer says, I think this picture is a cat. Now, at first, of course, it's really bad at doing this. Because these neural networks, they're like our brains. When we first create them, all these connections are random. But crucially, just like our own brain, this neural network has a mechanism to learn from experience and has a way to do better over time. And what it can do is it can take its prediction, so maybe at first this prediction is really bad, and we tell it what it's supposed to be, we tell it what the prediction is supposed to be, and it has a way to feed back into the network and to change these weights of these connections ever so slightly, such that the next time we get this, the exact same picture, it has a higher chance to predict the right category. So we train these systems just like we learn in our world. Now, as I said, these things are very flexible, and they've also been around for a really long time. But it's only in the last 10 years that the computers have become powerful enough for us to use these kind of artificial neural networks at the scale as necessary to solve our everyday problems. And what we've seen is these neural networks in the last few years being applied to solve a huge array of our everyday problems and do really amazing things. For example, it can recognize objects in video in real time. Uh, this is the same technology behind Google's self-driving cars. It allows the car to scan its environment in real time and figure out what all those pieces, those, those pixels in the 3D world represent what they are, if it's a person or a bike, where it's going, and what it's likely to do next. We also see these things playing human games, like Go, against human competitors, and doing exceptionally well. So I want to finish the night by showing you one last project from our design studio, and show you how we use artificial neural networks and the technologies of machine learning to solve another real-world design problem that we face in that project. And this project is the Embodied Computation Lab. And this is a new lab facility for the School of Architecture on the campus of Princeton University in Princeton, New Jersey. Now, this building is very simple in a lot of ways. Uh, it's basically a big industrial shed. And it's meant to provide this very flexible space where the researchers can experiment with robotics and sensory systems. But we wanted to use this building as a way to experiment with a lot of different sustainability technologies. For example, this whole building is made entirely out of wood. And this is very uncommon for an industrial building like this in the States. But the thing I want to focus on tonight is the facade of the building. And the facade of the building is also composed entirely out of wood. But this facade is made out of recycled, reused, scaffolding planks that come from job sites in New York City. So here's an image of this material. So these are scaffolding planks. Um, they're rated and standardized and industrialized by OSHA, our ratings agency. So they take these pieces of wood, they uh, cut them down to size, they measure the, their stiffness and make sure they're fit to be on the construction site. And they're used on the construction site for a period of a year. And after a year, they tend to be thrown away. Because it's a natural material, it degrades over time. But it degrades at different rates, right? Because some of these boards are outside for the whole year in the snow and the rain. Some of them are indoors. But the rule is you can't use it for more than a year in order to guarantee its safety. 
And as a result, a lot of these boards get thrown away. And what we wanted to do was see if we can use our facade as a way to give some of these boards a new life. So we salvaged 900 of these boards for our facade, and this is what we saw after we cleaned them up a bit. And what was really interesting to us about this image is even though these boards were originally highly standardized for very specific structural use, after a year of wear and tear and being in these different environments, the boards start to regain their natural variation, which of course they always had as a natural living material, right? And it became our mission to kind of give these boards new life by giving them back their individuality, to express even further the natural variation of all these different wood pieces. At the same time, we started working with an artist uh, in Brooklyn, working at the same facility as us. And this artist was experimenting with sandblasting pieces of wood. And here's a close-up of his experiments. And what he found is if you sandblast a piece of wood, you know, wood grows in layers, right? But it's also alternating between hard and soft layers. In the winter, the, the tree grows very slowly, so that layer is very hard. And the summer grows quickly, so that layer is softer. And if you sandblast that piece of wood, you start to eat away at the softer layers and expose these harder layers as these ridges. And what we saw in these images was not only their striking beauty, of course, but the fact that even more they start to express the individuality of each piece of wood, right? Because you imagine when you take a piece of wood and you run a saw against it, it creates this artificial smooth surface, starts to standardize all the wood. But hidden below is all these individual structures, which this process exposed. And even more, we were interested in what happens when you sandblast the knots of the boards. So the knots are where the tree branches used to come into the log, and these are somehow the most unique identifiers of each individual piece of wood. So our idea was to take all 900 boards of this facade and systematically sandblast just the location of each board where those knots were. Now we wanted to do this for 900 boards, and of course, doing this by hand, hiring this artist to do this in Brooklyn, would be extremely expensive, right? And extremely time consuming. So our crazy idea was to create an automated process to do this for us, leveraging robotics and artificial intelligence and machine learning. So we had this idea to create a fully automated system, starting with a machine learning model that was trained to identify wood, uh, knots and pieces of wood, and that machine learning model can feed that data directly into a CNC, computer controlled sandblasting machine that we designed, custom in our studio. And that sandblasting machine would sandblast all those little knots. And this would happen kind of automatically. So I was in charge of developing this machine learning model and we used the uh, off the shelf uh, open source machine learning library that was just uh, open sourced by Google a couple years ago called TensorFlow. And the orchestration of this machine learning model is relatively straightforward. The problem is, you know, these things don't know anything from the beginning, right? There is no computer that knows about wood or about knots or anything like that. So just like ourselves, we have to teach it how to identify these things, and we need a huge set of training data, of data that matches a piece of wood, an image of a piece of wood, with information about whether it has knots or doesn't have knots. So what we did to get this data is we created this kind of crowdsourcing system. We created this web app. So you have a web address, and you log into this web address, and it just gives you a picture of a piece of wood. And then it asks you to use your advanced uh, knowledge and intuition to just click on the button and tell the machine, do you think there's a knot in this picture or not? So we distributed this amongst our colleagues different universities, and we click, quickly generated this huge database, this training set of images to teach this machine how to identify knots. And this is what we got back, and you know, at this point you know that this is all about knots, so you can clearly see that the left images all have knots, and the right ones don't. But what's really interesting to me about this image is that that fact, that you know there's knots here and you don't, and there's no knots here, is probably not the first thing you notice about these images. Our eyes find patterns, right? So what you'll see is a huge variation of color and texture. You might miss the fact of this crucial difference that we were looking for. But because the machine learning model doesn't have any intuition or bias, we can just give it all this data and say, 
this is one thing, this is another thing. Learn what is it about these images that mean it's in this category or not in this category. So we use this training set and we train the machine learning model. So this is an image of the training process. So here, across the rows, you see three different samples of wood. And now we start the training process. So in the first iteration of the training, we ask uh, the model to tell us where things the knots are. And of course, it does a terrible job, right? But after only about 15 iterations of this training process, this might take two or three days on a standard laptop computer, we can see how it starts to localize that information about where the knot is and start to kind of zero in about exactly which part of that image is telling it that it belongs in this knot category. And here's some examples of the results. You can see how flexible it is. You can find long knots and circular knots, many knots in one image or just single one. So once we had the system, we fed all 900 boards through an imaging process. We pulled those images through the machine learning model and identified the location of all those knots. And then we sent that information to the CNC sandblasting machine that we built in our studio. And here's an image of the, of the whole data flow of the process. So you see the board image comes in, it's first cleaned. The machine learning model identifies where those knots are. That information gets directly put into machine code, G code, that drives the machine to just sandblast those areas where the knots are. So here you can see a few images of the boards being installed on site, and this building is just finishing construction on Princeton University's campus right now. And here you can start to see a little bit about why it was so important for us to use this natural wood material and to figure out a way to give this material its kind of individuality and its life back. So Princeton's campus is a kind of wooden environment, and we really wanted to see if we could use this technology in this very simple building to use this wood, but to recontextualize this building back into its natural, varied environment. And I'll end my talk tonight on this image. And for me, this image relates to the bigger point that I want to communicate to you guys tonight, which is where I see these technologies going in the future. And what I imagine is not machine learning and advanced computation taking over the jobs of architects or to automating our traditional design workflows. I see the future of technology as changing from computers being tools for design to real partners in design. And what I see in this image is an embodiment of that partnership between the intuition of a human designer and the capacity of a computer, of an artificial system, to allow us to scale up and do things that we couldn't do before. Thank you very much.